hear gunshots ring out to the delight of audiences. Gold is still sought after, and the blacksmith's hammer still resounds across the town. It's a tourist attraction right out of the Old West, but it's also part amusement park and part museum. Hi, I'm Jim Wilhelm. I'm surrounded by the buildings and shops that make up Donnelly's Wild West Town in Union. It's a place that got us beginning not as an entertainment park, but as a storage facility for the Donnelly family collection. Inside the main building are thousands of items taking visitors back to the late 18 and early 1900s. In addition, the museum houses one of the largest collections of Edison phonographs on public display anywhere. In the days before radio, when most homes didn't even have electricity, these machines were a revelation. Now people could listen to orchestras, popular tunes, famous artists with just a turn of the crank. Edison's phonograph used not discs, but pre-recorded cylinders that could play up to four minutes of material. At first, those cylinders were made of wax, which made them very brittle and sensitive to touch. But these cylinders had other uses too. This machine with a special attachment could record sound on blank wax cylinders. Now people could record family conversations, uh, children's recitals, using the horn as a microphone. Over here are forerunners to the jukebox. This model was used at Penny Arcades. It played a single selection that the customers had to listen to through these headphones. But Edison was not known just for sound. He also invented the kinetoscope. There are several of these projectors on display. Back then they were leased along with the film to individuals who would go from town to town putting on motion picture shows. Interestingly, each reel could only hold 10 minutes of film. That was the amount ordained by law for public safety, since film at that time was made of a very explosive nitrate base. While the reels were being rewound and changed, these projectors could show glass slides to keep the audience entertained. But there's more here than just the Edison machines. This is the first model of the disc player distributed by the Victor Company. It's the same model used in their trademark painting with the dog Nipper. Its founders named that company after winning a patent infringement suit. Victor is short for victory, and the disc machines with their longer format and ease of manufacturing were, in the end, the victors over the Edison cylinders. This is only about one-sixth of the machines owned by the Donnelly family. It's a collection turned family park, and it owes its beginning to an old car and the need for advertising. This all started uh, back in 1958 uh, when my father, Larry Donnelly, uh, he owned, opened up a gas station in Berwyn, Illinois, which is a suburb of Chicago. Uh, business wasn't very good at the gas station back then, so he decided that uh, what he needed was a sign in front of the gas station. Uh, he decided it would be an old Model T Ford, which he would build from junk parts from local scrap yards and such. Uh, uh, he was building the car, needed a few more parts, and one uh, Sunday morning took my brother and I to uh, Maxwell Street in Chicago, which is a very famous flea market. It's no longer in existence, but in the 50s it was the granddaddy of all flea markets. He found the parts he needed for the car and also bought an old phonograph with a broken spring on it for five dollars. Uh, he brought it back to the gas station and fixed it. That broken phonograph eventually led to this large collection of Edison's machines. Meanwhile, the car he built, which is also on display, not only generated business, but a new passion for collecting. Well, in the late 50s, Berwyn was mostly older Bohemians who threw nothing away. And uh, they had all this old, thi old, type, old things in their attic. Uh, and when he decided uh, that he could trade them for the car repairs for the junk in the attic, the collection took off. By 1970, he had uh, semi-trailers, 
in back of the gas station all loaded and all the gar uh, garages in the area loaded full of junk or antiques and collectibles. Many of those items are on display at the Street of Yesteryear exhibit. Here storefronts are packed with period pieces, each reflecting a different theme. One of the most popular is the toy store, filled with hundreds of items from the turn of the century, from board games to wind-up toys. There's even a section filled with old trains, a favorite among many visitors. The toy trains were, uh, again, a favorite of my father's, was something he collected over the years. Uh, uh, I, I think, you know, a lot of that has to do with when kids were growing up as things that they wanted and never had. Another area that draws attention is the doctor's office. When we were looking for cabinets for the, for the main museum building to display the phonograph collection, we ran across a drugstore in uh, Cicero, Illinois. It was on uh, 22nd Laramie, right across the street from the old hotel where Al Capone's headquarters were. And uh, the pharmacy had opened up in the 20s, and this was early 1970s, and the owners were retiring and selling out. So we bought all the fixtures out of there, including all the cabinets. Well, when we were stripping all the cabinets out of there, in the back room, we opened up a door, and there was this old doctor's office in there. And on questioning the owner what this was all about, he said, oh, my brother, he said, uh, he's a doctor. Well, he's not really a doctor, but he treats patients. We said, what do you mean he treats patients? Well, he still has customer uh, uh, or a patient base here. In fact, he was treating patients well into the 1970s, still using some of this equipment, including this machine that used electricity for healing. Across the way is a storefront that is a little less scary. Most of the items in that barber shop came out of uh, a Chicago area. Uh, over the years, we collect things out of uh, uh, various locations and, and, and put them together. Uh, the old barber chair we found in, the, in, in a, an old man's garage and was totally covered in, uh, in pigeon dung, and, and we restored that. Uh, but literally everything in there did come out of operating barber shops. The colognes and the bottles are still the colognes that were in there back at the turn of the century. Telegraph office uh, is uh, very interesting uh, because of that early uh, communication technology in there. You'll see a, a, a lot of phones uh, that people had in their homes. Uh, in fact, one of the phones in there was still operating in 1968. One of the hand crank wall phones uh, came out of Wisconsin. They didn't strip the last uh, party lines out of there until the late 60s. It's interesting how these everyday items, in use not so long ago, can appear so ancient by today's standards. And while this collection is no longer growing by leaps and bounds, it still maintains a special place in the main building. But this is called Donnelly's Wild West Town, and while the collection continues to grow, parts of it have taken on a Western flavor. And while the names highlighted here may not be familiar, their stories are very interesting. In this case are items that once belonged to Charles Borowski. He was a Russian-born immigrant who served under General George Custer during the Civil War until he was wounded and mustered out of the service. After the war, he rejoined Custer at Fort Abraham Lincoln as a civilian wagon master for the 7th Cavalry. He was even at the Battle of the Little Big Horn but way in the rear with the supply wagons. On display is his Civil War saber, along with a walnut dresser he used at Fort Lincoln. Then there's this picture he kept of Custer and his wife taken in their study at the fort. We're told it's one of only three surviving copies. But you can't talk about the West without mentioning outlaws and gunfights. Behind me are a few of the remaining death masks created for the Pop Palmer Freak Circus, which toured the country around the turn of the century. It's said some of these masks came from the actual subjects, while others were fashioned from measurements and photos. This is one of Crawford Goldsby, who was better known as Cherokee Bill. During his life, he murdered more than 13 people, the first one when he was only 12 years old and it was his brother-in-law, just because he told him to feed the hogs. And on his gallows, he was asked if he would like to say something. He said, nope, I came here to die, not to make a speech. 
The death of this person touched off a disagreement over the payment of a reward. This was a face of Harvey Logan, who was born in Iowa in 1867, but he's better known to the world as Kid Curry, who rode for a time with Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch. His end came in 1904, when instead of surrendering to a posse which had him surrounded, he took his own life. But controversy continued to follow him when the railroad company, not wishing to pay the hefty reward that they had promised, repudiated the body's identification. Originally, this facility was conceived as a storage and exhibit area for the family's increasing collection. And at first it was called Antique Village. Well, they noticed that while the adults enjoyed the displays, the children weren't very interested. So they decided to build some additional displays outside, which has since become Wild West Town. Here kids can board a scale model of a C.P. Huntington locomotive that takes them on a tour of western sites. Also, there are these restored Hodges hand cars. A staple of most amusement parks during the 30s and 40s, they're now being rediscovered by a new generation. One of the first attractions here, and still the most popular, is gold mine. Here several troughs are filled with gravel and flowing water where guests can pan for gold. Well, actually, gold pyrite. In fact, Wild West Town is one of the largest users of that mineral in the country, buying two tons of it every year. Each visitor who pans for gold is given a small bag in which to take home their cache of gold flakes. Prospecting for gold was not an easy way to make a living. First, areas where gold was found were immediately overwhelmed by prospectors, leading to many fights and even deaths. And then if you were lucky enough to find a spot along a creek bed or a stream, the process was tedious. Sand and gravel were scooped up and the large pieces of rock were picked out by hand. Then using a swirling motion, the lighter particles were gradually washed out, leaving the heavier gold flecks at the bottom. Rarely were any sizable nuggets discovered, but back then nothing went to waste in the search for wealth. Even the most minute gold particles were collected using a deadly process, which another display at the museum recounts. Mercury was added to the pan to collect the tiniest particles and then strained through a cloth. That cloth was then burned off in a fire brick vessel, leaving behind the gold dust, but also creating toxic mercury vapors. It seems only appropriate that once the attraction began to grow, gunfights were sure to follow. And to the delight of the audience, that's exactly what happened. One, two, three! Throughout the year, employees who are trained by a film stuntman put on shows for visitors. One person who took this show very seriously has gone on to Hollywood as a stuntman and has appeared in over 50 movies. In fact, these shows are so popular that a special performance area had to be constructed. And there are other family attractions here too, such as pony rides, lasso lessons, uh, there are specialty shops and a steakhouse. There's also a fully functioning blacksmith shop with original tools where wagon repairs are made and custom ironworks are still produced. But that's not the only place where repairs are needed around here. The Donnellys also have a shop that specializes in repairing Edison phonographs. As we've seen, what began as one family's obsessive collecting has led to a scene right out of the Old West. To reach Donnelly's Wild West Town, call 815-923-9000 or log on to their website at www.wildwesttown.com.